good afternoon, dear student, and welcome to the second part of our numerical method class. Today, we will continue with the rational function approximation. If you recall uh, the drawback of the polynomial interpolation, which is a poly yeah, polynomial uh, approximation. Polynomial interpolation is a form of polynomial approximation. With polynomial, we know that um, if the number of point, that is the number of sample point or, or grid point is increased, the degree of the polynomial also will increase. And as the degree of the polynomial increases, the drawback will be that there will be wiggles at the end point. So meaning that the error will be very large. So you cannot trust you cannot trust an approximation whose error is very large. So that's one of the drawbacks of polynomial interpolation. So one advantage also here with the uh, rational function is that that type of error will be reduced. Right, it will be reduced. Okay, so let's start. Um, with the definition of what is a rational function. A rational fun function is nothing else than the ratio of two polynomials. So in this case, we have Rx, which is a polynomial. Rx is a polynomial of degree capital N, meaning that capital N is the degree of the numerator, which is Px plus the degree of the denominator qx. So if you add up the degree of these two, it will give us capital N. So let's say the degree of the numerator is N and the degree of the denominator is M. So the degree of uh, this uh, rational function will be lowercase n plus lowercase m. All right, so that's the best I can say there. Okay, so uh, we substitute the expression of Pn and Qn in formula equal equation 1.21. It gives us this expression. So meaning now, if you want, we have to count the number of unknowns because in order for us to determine this rational function, we need to determine all the coefficients appearing in this expression meaning that we have to compute P0, P1 up to Pn. So in total, we have lowercase n plus one coefficient, similarly for the denominator. So in total, what we will compute will be n plus m plus two, one for Q0 and one for P0. So it'll be m, n plus m plus two. So if we can reduce this, uh, this number, even if it's by one, it's still okay. It's still fine. We are gaining at least. So in this case, if we assume that uh, zero cannot be a root uh, of the denominator, right? If you assume that zero, zero cannot be a root, that implies that Q zero can be assumed to be non-zero. Why? Because if this is zero, if Q zero is zero and we substitute zero in X, we see that it gives us zero in the denominator. So we will assume that zero cannot be a root. And for that purpose, it means that Q zero is non-zero. And if Q zero is non-zero, we can factor this entire expression by Q zero. I think I need to write this in detail so that students will understand because when I mentioned this, some uh, remain confused. So this is exactly how we reduce that uh, that uh, polynomial. So what we do here, if Q0 is non-zero, I can 
factor the entire denominator by Q0, right? So meaning, uh, let me write it here. So I can write my Rx as, in the denominator, I have the following expression. I have Q0 here, I factor, and now the position of Q0 becomes one because I factor by Q0. And then the remaining terms, the next one will be Q1 by Q0 into X, all the way up to the last term, which is Qm by Q0, into xm. Now the numerator remains on, 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 on change. It will be on change, but I can still take this because uh, it will be equivalent to say that I'm dividing all the terms in the numerator by q0. So if I do that, I can then take it in the numerator so I can say that the numerator will be the first one will be P0 by Q0 plus P1 by Q0 into X plus all the way to Pn by Q0 into Xn. So that will be our numerator. Now you see that if I relabel this as P0 prime, P1 prime up to Pn prime, and this one, Q1 prime up to Qn prime. So let me write it here. I can say that this will be equal to P0 prime plus P1 prime x all the way to P n prime x n by one, this one, and then this one I relabel it as Q one prime into x plus all the way up to Q M prime X to the M. Now you see that if I assume that Q zero is non-zero, I can I, I can I can let this to be one. That's exactly what we have done here. You see, why can we let it to be one? Because we can divide throughout by Q zero, and this becomes our one. And all these new coefficients, we call that prime, and we can remove the prime and still call that P0, P1 up to Pn, and this Q1 up to that. So it's exactly uh, what is being done when we say that we can assume that Q0 is one and we just put one day. This is the, the old process. Hmm? This is the whole process that allows us to say we can just assume it's one and put it there. So this is a step, this is the explanation. It's exactly this. All right, so by so doing, we reduce the number of unknown by one, which is not uh, negligible, right? Okay, so what next? Uh, we can move to the next slide. This is where we are going to uh, de de design a method that we will call Pade approximating method. Pade approximating method will consist of designing a technique that will allow us to compute the remaining n plus m plus one coefficient, that is capital N plus one, the remaining coefficient. So how do we proceed? Uh, first of all, we assume uh, that zero is, uh, is in the interval AB, the interval over which we are approximating our, our now our, our rational function. Okay, so what do we want? We want to approximate uh, this function f using the polynomial. 
So actually, we have f of x approximately r x. So this r x. Obviously, uh, in in the in some question paper or test, you will see that here we put two subscript, right? Uh, the the subscript. Uh, okay, let me write here. That is the same as r. The degree of the numerator is n. You can write it here, comma, m of x. So meaning that the first represent the degree of the numerator, the second subscript, the degree of the denominator. So if you see that, it means that in your Maclaurin expansion here, you, you can expand and explicitly write the terms because capital N here will be this sum. Hmm? Capital N actually is the sum of m plus n. So if you have these two subscript, you know what capital N is. And you need the coefficient A0 up to A N plus N, because that, that's what you need to determine uh, the, the, the coefficient of P N X and Q N X, Q M X. Okay, so it's worth, uh, it's, it is uh, worth mentioning. All right, so, so the, the next thing to do, because we want to approximate our function f of x with this rational function, we compute the difference. Eh? We compute f of x minus qx, uh, sorry, f of x minus rx. And what is, what is rx? rx is the ratio px by qx. So if we reduce this expression to the same denominator, that's cross multiplication, then we have f of x times qx minus px divided by qx. So this is a result. Now, we know what Q is, we know what P is. So we substitute P and Q by these expressions, these, these two expressions. So we substitute there, which we got, I mean, that is those expressions can be written in summation, in the summation form. Now, the next thing is to write the McLaurin expansion of this because, uh, F is defined in the neighborhood of zero, so we can use uh, our x zero to be zero and obtain Maclaurin series, which is Taylor series when x zero is zero. So this is our series. Then we can take this substitute back into the expression of the numerator. We obtain this expression. Good. So if we do that, this is what we obtain, equation 1.23. Now this is how we develop our, our method. We impose that the k derivative of this function of this difference at zero is equal to zero for all the derivatives starting from the zero ordered up to the capital N order, where capital N is the sum of N, lowercase n plus lowercase m, where N is the degree of the numerator, which is Px, and m, lowercase m, is the degree of the denominator, Qx. Now, if you impose this condition, you can see already that by imposing that this at zero is zero, it means that zero is a root of this difference. Well, that is when k is zero, because if k is zero, it will give you this. Now, if k is one, it will be the first derivative. Zero is also will be a root of the first derivative. Zero will be a root of the second up to the capital nth derivative of this difference. So in other words, it means that zero is a root of this difference with multiplicity capital N plus one. What is the multiplicity? Let me quickly define what is the multiplicity of a root. In order to do that, Let me open this. Uh, 
uh, what I will do here, I will assume Okay, I assume that we have a function f of x equal to zero. And alpha, a root of the function f. That is, f of alpha is zero. If you say it's a root, it means that it is a zero. So f of alpha, is zero. If f of alpha is zero, what does that mean? It means that x minus alpha divide f of x. So in other words, we can write f of x as x minus alpha times um let, let's let's see times okay let's say q of course that q has nothing to do with the previous q okay let me let's just see q yeah that's that that's what it means that's just a definition hmm? okay that, that 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 that's how we can write this now multiplicity Alpha is a root of f of multiplicity m if we can write f of x to be equal to x minus alpha to the m, to the power of m, times a certain function gx with g alpha not zero. Why do we impose this condition? Because the multiplicity m is the is the is the highest exponent for which this is true. It is the highest. But now, if g of alpha is uh, zero. It means that we could write this g of alpha in this form. In this form, let me call this, uh, okay, we call this equation one, we call this equation two, and this is three. Now you see that equation two, you can replace f of x with this g if we assume that g of alpha is zero. You mean that g x could be written in this form. Now, you see, if you take this, substitute there, this x minus alpha will multiply x minus alpha to the m. It will become x minus alpha to the m plus 1 qx. Now, you see that uh, this will no longer be the maximum because we can still find something greater than m for which we have something of this form similar. You see, so that's why g of alpha should be non-zero, so that this m is the highest exponent for which this uh, equation, equation three, holds. Right. So that 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 is it. So we need you need to to really bear that in mind, and that would be very good. Okay. So that that is what multiplicity means. I will give an example. I will give an example. Example, obviously this notion of multiplicity is not that important for this uh, course, but it's good for a general knowledge. You see, 
because you can see that in, we find ourselves in a situation where we need multiplicity. You might read a, a textbook somewhere else or in a problem where you need to define what is a multiplicity, use a property of multiplicity maybe to prove or do something. Because some of you did not do that in one of the previous module. When you, you come to this place, you see we'll be spending time now to explain to you what multiplicity is. That's why I always mention the fact that each concept in mathematics is important. If a concept is supposed to be known at the first year level or second year level or third year level, make sure that you have that knowledge. And um, I encourage you to buy textbooks of various levels and read through so that if you discover that I need this knowledge, make sure you have that knowledge. Right. There are so many resources nowadays available to you uh, on the internet, all over. Oh. Oh, sorry, or oh, to the library. There are enough resources for you mm, to have that knowledge. Okay, so without uh, uh, spending more time on, on this, uh, I will stop here and we will, we will proceed with our normal uh, lecture. Otherwise, it may take more time. Okay. Yeah, it's true that I mentioned the, 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 the example, which, which I skip. But the example, the, the purpose of the example is just to allow you to understand why we say from this statement that the multiplicity of zero in this case is, uh, what is it, capital N plus one. So I can do that example here. So for the example, if I take for instance f of x, equal to x, let's say x minus one. Why not cube? I can write that cube. Already from here, we can see that from the definition of multiplicity, m is three here for alpha equal to one, right? Okay, but let's assume that we don't know this, we don't know this. Now, if I differentiate this, if I compute f of alpha, which is one, so I have f of one, which is f zero, the zero derivative, I mean, of one, you see that is zero. Why? Because if I put one here, this will be one minus one cube, which is zero. So this is zero. Now, if I take k equal to one, the first derivative of this function, u will be three, is it over with three? Okay, right, let me write here. I can write all those derivatives here. I have f prime of x is three x minus one square. The second derivative will be six x minus one. And now you can see that the third derivative, this is second. And then the third derivative, which I can write in bracket, x would just be six, which is non-zero. Okay, now if I come if I come here now, I say f prime of one. If I put one there, it's zero. So I can say f prime one of one is zero. Second derivative, similarly, I can say f second derivative at one. If I put second one here in the second derivative, you can all see that it's still zero. Right. Zero. But above that, if I if I do the same now for the the, the multiplicity itself is non-zero. You can see, non-zero. Now, 
You understand now why when we have all the derivative up to n being zero, because that's what we are imposing, that all the possible derivative at zero that can be zero are for k equal to zero up to capital N. So it means that we are also assuming that if we replace k with n plus one, it will be non-zero. So we find ourselves in this situation, we can then conclude that the highest derivative for which it is zero, to that we add one, you see the highest is two, we add one to that, assuming that from that plus one, that is two plus one, which is from the third derivative is non-zero. In that case, three, which is the highest derivative for which is zero plus one, is the multiplicity. So similarly here, since this is true up to capital N, so if I add one to this N, the multiplicity will be capital N plus one. Okay, so I hope that I've given you a valuable information that you will, uh, you will use efficiently. Okay, so uh, we are done with that example. So let's quickly continue. Anyway, there's no need even to erase. Let, let me just continue. So the time to erase my... Okay. You will take time. All right. So because of this conclusion, the fact that um, the multiplicity of zero is n plus one, how many equations do we have by imposing this condition? Because we have an equation, right? Because in this expression, we have this coefficient. They are all there. They are all in this expression. Now we impose n plus one equation because that's already n plus one equation that we are imposing. And we know already that the total number of unknown is also capital N, oh, sorry. Uh, we have capital N plus one because it starts from zero. So we have capital N plus one equation and the number of unknown here, I mentioned it before, uh, previously, is capital N plus one because it will be N plus n plus one for this p zero because q zero is already set to one. So it will be a total number of equation equal to the number of unknown. So you can see that with this one, I will be able to get a unique solution for our coefficient. Right, okay. So this condition is can be shown, right? Because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process to show that uh, this condition 120 is equivalent to say, yeah, I already mentioned it, that uh, uh, x equal to zero is a root of multiplicity n plus one. Okay, uh, and this is an example that I gave here. So the consequence of that is we can find all these uh, coefficients by imposing that in this numerator, because this numerator is a series, we can impose that in that numerator, there will be no coefficient of x to the n for, when I say x to the n, x to the k, uh, x to the k, of course, when I say x to the k, um, it has nothing to, okay, x to the k. Okay, this is a series, I take an arbitrary co coefficient that I call it x to the k. So no term of degree less than or equal to capital N should appear in this expression. Right, it's, it's, an, it's, it's another consequence of, of the of 1.24. So in other words, if I if I if I write the numerator, because remember that we are setting this to zero, right? We are setting this to zero, and setting this to zero also means that the, we are setting the numerator to be zero. And the fact that the, the multiplicity is capital N plus one, the consequence will be that we will be able to solve this by imposing that in this expansion of the numerator all the terms of degree less than or equal to capital N should be set to zero. So meaning that in this expansion, the terms that will be present will start from 
x to the capital n plus one, capital n plus two, capital n, up to infinity. The remaining terms, that is from zero for k, exponent of z, um, x to the k, where k runs from zero to n, should be set to zero. Those one will not appear here. That's exactly what you mean. So in order to find out the system of equation that we'll be solving for that purpose, we will need to write the general expression of a term of this expansion. Because it's a series, what we need to do is to just write the general term of that. So in order to do that conveniently, uh, what, what, what we can do, is to write, uh, if, if I had, let's say for instance, I have two series. Uh, let's say I have the first series S. Let's say that S is A, zero, X, A, one, X, up to infinity. It's a series, right? And S to the second series, it will be B zero, oh, sorry, there's no X here. Just, okay, let me write it properly. So S uh, one is sum A K X to the K, where K runs from zero to infinity. Similarly for S two, S2 will be that sum from zero to infinity, bk, xk. I can change k with, I can replace k with i and this with j, it's a dummy variable, so it's not important. Now we want to find the general expression of the product, which I can call c, is the product of the first by the second series. We know that the product of two series is still a series, so that one will be written as a certain sum, uh, k running from zero to infinity, c, k, x, k. Now I want to find the general expression of this c, k in terms of a and B, these two coefficients, right? So it is easy to show that the CK actually will be a finite sum, right? Let's say if we take I running from zero to K, now we take the first coefficient A, I, and then the second one B, sub K minus I. So what do you realize here is that um, if I add the subscript of A plus the subscript of B, this I with a minus I will cancel out, we are left with B, uh, K, we are left with K which is a subscript of this. And we sum i from zero to k, which is the subscript of c. So that is how you get a term of the product in terms of each term of the series. That's how we get a general. It's a finite sum from zero to k, k being the subscript of c, k, of, of, of the subscript of c. Okay. Um, let me give you a simple example. Uh, I'm just, I'm just, uh, you see we have issue with space. We have to erase, but it's already there. Okay, a simple example, for instance, what we can do, 
Um, okay, let me, let me take this. Uh, I will just take C1 to be finite and C2 to be finite so that we can quickly see the pattern. If I take uh, the first one, let's say to be A, zero plus A one X plus A two X square. And the second one to be B zero plus B one X, B two X, Way. Let us just stop there. It's finite. We can go to infinity, but finite is not. We know already that the degree of this is four, right? So we can write this as C0 plus C1 X plus C2 X squared plus C3 X cubed plus C4 X to the fourth, because the highest degree here, X squared by X squared will be X to the fourth. And these various Cs, those coefficients are what we have here. So you agree with me that if we expand this, we can do that. We can do that. Mm. If we expand, uh, okay, then we say equal here for the next row. If I take this, multiply by that, I have A zero B zero, which is the only term that will be constant. That will be my C0, you can see from here. If I take this, multiply by that, it is A0, B0. But if I multiply that by anything else, X will be present, so I can proceed. I cannot take this, X is already present, and multiply by anything. I cannot take either. Now, if I come here, I take this, anyway, it's already there. So that's the only thing. I just take terms here and I multiply by everything there. So you can see that the only constant term will be this, and that will be our CK. Now, let's put k here, substitute in this formula. Let's substitute k equal to zero. If we take k to be zero, you can see that i, the only value that i will be able to take will be zero because I'll be running from zero to zero, meaning that it takes only one value. So if i is zero, I put, um, if i is zero, I mean, if k is zero, i is zero, right? So I can put zero here, which is the value of k. i also is zero, b will be zero. The, the subscript will be, will be zero because it will be zero minus zero, so that's zero. I also, we saw that it's zero. So all this sum for k equal to zero, c zero will be a zero, b zero. And that's the only thing we have. Good. Plus, now, if you look at all the coefficient of x, let's look at the various coefficient of x here. A zero, for the coefficient of x, a zero will multiply what? The only possibility would be that X, A0 multiply B1. A0, B1. If I take A0 multiply by B2, X will be present. Wait, what am I saying? No, we can only multiply. If I multiply by B2, it will be X squared because this is squared. This is squared. So I cannot, I cannot perform that multiplication. So the only one is this one, the coefficient of X. Okay. That is for A0. Can I use A1 to multiply? Yes. Because this X here, the only term should be a term that does not contain X, and it will be A1, B0. A1, B0. Can I proceed with A1 again? No, I can. Can I use B2? No, because the factor of, B, uh, of A2 is X cubed. So I can. So that's the only term. So I can proceed in the like manner with, and I will stop there. I will only stop at two. You can do the same thing for X3 and X4. Now for C2, so this is C0. We check already for that. We have not yet checked for C1 and for C2 because we are still to compute C2. Oh, sorry. Okay, okay, now let's look at the factors of x square, x square. So can I use A2? Is there any possible product with A0, which will give us a factor of yes? If you multiply A0 with B2, we have x square here. So I can write A0, B2. Then we have x square. Good, that's a factor already. 
this is a coefficient of x squared with a0. Can I use it? a1? Yes. What will a1 multiply for us to get a factor of x squared? a1 will only multiply b1 because this x and that x will give us a square. So a1, b1. That's all. Because if I use a1 and multiply by b2, the factor will be x cubed. So I cannot, we cannot perform that. Can we use a2? Yes, we can use a2 for a factor of x squared, meaning that we only need to multiply by something that does not contain x, and that would be b0. x squared. So this will be our c2, and it can continue, but we'll stop here. So we check for k equal to zero. We, we saw that uh, the only term would be a0, b0. Now, if k is equal to one, what will happen? If we take a k equal to one, let me write here, if k is equal to one, now our c1 will be the sum i running from zero to one, because we run up to k, k is one, and then we have this a i b k is one minus i. So what are the possible values of i? I can take the value zero and you can take the value one. So if i is equal to zero, what would we have? If i is equal to zero, we have a zero b one. Now, when i is equal to one, we have a one and then b the i is one so the subscript of b will be one minus one which is zero so you see that for c1 we have a0 b1 a0 b1 plus a1 b0 plus a1 b0 so we have exactly this term we can do the same thing with uh, k equal to to two so if k is equal to two what do we have if k is equal to two, if k is equal to two, in the same formula, we have C2, which is the sum from this formula here. We have sum i running from zero to the value of k, which is two, a i b k that is two minus i there are three values i will take the value of zero and then the value of one finally the value of two so let's substitute we have three terms in total so if i is equal to zero we have a zero b two now when i is equal to one we have a one b two minus one is one plus when now i is equal to 2, we have a 2, b sub 2 minus 2, b 0. Three terms, 1, 2, 3. Now let's check a 0, b 2, and then a 1, b 1, a 1, b 1. Finally, a 2, b 0, a 2, b 0. Correct. So that is it for this. Now you understand how we compute uh, the general term of a series or the product of two polynomials or whatsoever. I gave you everything in detail. So you have the information. You can re-watch the, the video anytime you want. Pause it. Try on your own. Then the knowledge will be there. So if you recall the formula that we just wrote for the product, we can do exactly the same thing here in the numerator because don't forget that in the numerator of uh, f of x minus rx, we have two terms. We have this term, which is already finite, and which ha we have this other term, which is the product we are talking about. So we can write that same product, but now for this expansion. And to that, we will subtract this term. Now, if you look at this, this is like our a in our c. And our B now will replace B with Q. So uh, let me rewrite what was there before in terms of, uh, of CK. If you recall the expression of CK, I said that CK was what? We wrote CK to be the sum, right? I equal to zero up to K, that is the subscript, 
we have a sub i and b k minus i in such a way that if you add these two substrate, you will give us k. And the sum is from zero to k. Now, we saw that uh, b is equal to q in, a, in, a, in, 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 the, in, this, in this expansion, in this numerator. You see, this is the first term, there's the second factor. Now, in our CK, we use this as BK or BI. Now, we replace B with Q. If we do that, if we set B equal to Q, we obtain that CK is what? It will be this sum I running from 0 to K, A sub I, Q sub K minus I. Right. That is for the first term. Now, if you take, uh, so this is just a factor of xk, right? Because uh, the, 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 this factor, ck, is the factor of xk, right? That's the factor of xk where? In this expansion, in this expansion. Now, for the second term here, what is the? What is the factor of xk? So if I look at xk here, if I let this uh, oh, here in the sum, this because j is, uh, i is running from 0 to n, if I set i to be k, you see that we will have, of course, there's a negative here. I will not forget that. You have the negative, this negative. Then if I set i equal to k, then we have p sub k x to the k. So I take this factor or this term in the numerator, I add to the to this one, to this term here. So it will be minus PK. So if I want that, so it will be, I will have this CK and the other one minus, uh, what did I say? Is it PK? Yeah, PK, not, not, not uh, that, this P. P, K, X to the K. So now if I want the single term, it will be C, K minus P, K, X, K. So the term that we are looking for is this one. And what is it? C, K minus P, K will be the sum minus P, K in front. Right. So... So it will be this sum. So meaning that we have this entire sum. We have this sum. Here. Yeah. And minus P K. So this is what we are looking for. So the coefficient of xk in the numerator will be given by this expression, and that's exactly what we have here. So that is the factor we are looking for, this one. The sum minus pk. You can see it's a sum running up to k, and then a sub i, q sub k minus i, exactly what we have here. Good, so I can erase this, I can delete. All this, the explanation has been given, which is the most important thing. Uh, thing. Most important thing. Good. All right, so that's the coefficient we're looking for, which is given. Now, this is what we will set to zero because we say that there should be no term of degree less than or equal to capital N. If we say that there is no, it means that all those coefficients are set to zero. So in other words, we will set this to zero. If we set that to zero, we take this to the right-hand side, we obtain this. So this is a system that we are actually solving the system. That is the system we are solving. Good. Application, we are going to look at at an example to make things simple. 
find the fit per day uh, approximation for f of x equal to exponential x. You see that f of x is given. It is given. Now we are told that fit degree per day approximation. Remember that this fit degree is the degree of what? Rx. So degree of Rx is five. Meaning that this is our capital N. But are we given lowercase n and lowercase m? They are not given in the problem. But actually in any problem, it should be given. So in this case, we are taking n to be two, uh, n, no, sorry, to be three, and m to be two. So that's why, and you see if you sum them, it gives us five. So this is our choice. We are choosing it, right, with that. n equal to three, m equal to two. That one should be given. It's not up to you to do that. Okay, now, remember that in, in the process, we, we need to know the a case. The a case are the values of the coefficient of the one Mac Lawrence series. You can see that the a case come from the McLaurin series approximation of the function f of x that we want to approximate with a rational function or the, uh, yeah, the rational function. So in this case, this is our approximation, the Paddy approximation. You know what is uh, the approximation for exponential? You just expand it. Fifth degree, it means that what we need in our computation are this coefficient up to the fifth degree. Obviously, it's a series. Normally, you are supposed to add this to indicate it's a series. It's not a polynomial, it's a series. But the terms or the coefficient we are interested in, those that will play in the computation of P and Q are these six coefficients. One, one, one half, one six, one twenty fourth, one hundred and twentieth. These are the coefficients that we will need to use in the process or here in this uh, equation. But this is what we are using. That's what we are solving. Good. So if we take, because we know already what those coefficients are, I will give you a caveat here. Because we set that to zero. We expand. Okay. It's not important to impose that now. Okay. If you just ex if you if you substitute this into that, you have to be very careful not to exceed capital N in this expansion. Because if you exceed capital N, your result will be wrong your end result will be wrong why because if you look at this formula you can see that the values of k here subscript will not exceed that value of n you can see k runs from zero up to capital n so you can see that so in other words it means that you don't exceed this that is you don't exceed x to the n you don't exceed that so if x to the n plus one and greater are present in this or there, your result will be wrong. So this should not be there. You can have x zero, which is one a, a constant. You can have x, you can all, up to xn. Those are the factors of n that will be present in your equation. So you have to be very careful, otherwise you can really mess up and get the wrong result. So the best way for you to avoid making such mistakes is just uh, to use this formula. If you are not sure that you will expand this properly, because I ex while expanding, you can multiply this x to the five, maybe with this one, you see that the degree of x or the, 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 the coefficient or the, the exponent of x, if you multiply this, if you if by mistake you mult you take this, you multiply by that, remember it will exceed. Our capital N here is five, right? In our case here is five. 
But if you multiply these two, it becomes six because you multiply x by x to, uh, by x to the five, you become x to the six. And if you include that in your computation, you are already wrong. So that's why I'm insisting on that so that you don't, you don't make those type of mistakes. Okay, so I repeat again, the best thing is just to use the above formula than to expand this. But if you are sure of yourself that you will not make any mistake, just tell uh, yourself that, okay? Or say to yourself that in this expansion, you don't need to find x to a power greater than five. That's also the best way to check. Okay, so uh, let's quickly perform the expansion. If you don't want, hmm, some of you might say, oh, it's difficult for me to remember this, okay. Then you will take that. If you understand the formula for CK, as I explained, you, you, there's no way you will not be able to remember. Okay, so now you take that, you expand, just make sure that you don't exceed the power of five. Hmm. This is already there. Then you set that to zero, take this to the right hand side. You equate the like factors. If you equate, it will give you exactly this equation star, this one. Right. If you equate, it will give you exactly that. Okay, now I have a fifth order polynomial that I'm equating with the third order polynomial. It means that the like, I will equate the like coefficient, meaning uh, this is a constant coefficient, should be equated with the constant coefficient there. So I can say that one is equal to P0 or P0 is equal to one is the same thing. Now I have this, this factor of X is equal to the factor of X there. So I can write that P1, P1 is equal to that. That is one plus Q1 and P2 will be equal to what? The factor of X, Square here, that would be one half plus Q1 plus Q2 and uh, P3 will be equal to the factor of FQ, which is this one, one six plus one half into Q1 plus Q2. And uh, finally, because I'm done with, the, with this, uh, the first row there on top, now I'm left with this one. So meaning that here I can write that this is zero into x to the power of four plus zero into x to the power of five, which is our capital N. So this is zero, that's zero. So I will equate this to zero, equate that to zero. So I have this one. So you can see that we have two equations in Qs only, because here you can see that P and Q are mixed, right? When we equate, okay? See that I have P here, I have P here, I have Q there, P here, Q there, P here, Q there. They are mixed when we equate. But for the last two equations, it's only in an equation in Qs. There's no P present. And the number of equations is equal to what? We have two equations. So we have zero equal to this or this equal to zero. It's the same thing. So one by 24 plus one six, Q1 plus one half, Q2 is equal to zero. And the last one, one by 120 plus one by 24, Q1 plus one six Q2 is equal to zero. Something you should not never forget is how to solve this system because you can get a system and get the wrong answer. So this is the system, right? Which is uh, written here. It's exactly the same thing. But I we did it together just for you to see the steps. Okay, so that's the system that we are solving, this one. Now, I will give you a trick to check if uh, what you are doing is correct, if you are on the right track or wrong track. You can always check that. And the best way for you to check it is to look at the various degrees. What is the degree of P, the numerator, and what's the degree of Q, the denominator? Numerator, the degree is three. The degree of the denominator is two. 
And the denominator is the one that has only Qs. I, I mean, the Qs is in the denominator. And the number of equation in Q that you'll be solving before substituting in the values of P is equal to the degree. Oh, it's equal to the value, it's two. You can see here, we have M is two. So meaning that for Q, you'll be having two equations and there will be two unknowns. You can see here, two equations, two unknowns, that's two. Now, if you come back here, you can see that you said equal to zero, one, two equation corresponding to M equal to two. So M is equal to two. M equal to two gives you the number of equation in Q, oh, sorry. Gives the number of equation in Q that you will be solving all the time. So we have M equal to two, meaning that you have two Qs and two equations. So you always start with that last equation in Q. Once you compute Q1 and Q2, you just substitute in the expression of P. In this expression, if I know Q1, I know P1. Because P0 is one, it's always given directly. Now, if I know Q1 and Q2, substitute here, I have P2. Q1, Q2, substitute here, I have P3. You can see that the numerator, the degree is three. That will correspond to one, two, three that you need to determine. But this one will always give you a constant value. So you don't need to solve for this. You always solve for P1, P2, P3. Or P1, P up to Pn. That's the equation that you will solve. And here, M equal to two. You have two equations in two and for Q. Solve that first. So you start here. This is first step. You solve this one. And here, this is the second step. If you miss that order, be sure that you will not get the answer. I can guarantee you. OK, now. Uh, OK, that, the next thing that I would do with you will be to solve this system. Hmm? We, we can, I, let, let's quickly do that. We can quickly solve that system. So this, I can uh, rearrange this. I can multiply the entire equation by 24 because this is a larger denominator. Take this one to the other side, it becomes negative. Multiply this entire equation by 120. Take this to the other side, it becomes negative one. So if we do that for the numerator, this one, if I multiply by 24, this will give me four, right? Because 24 is four by six. So if I write four by six, because I will multiply the entire numerator by 24, 24 and 24 will cancel out. We will, we will be left with one. Now we take to the other side, become negative one. Here we have 24, which is six by four. I cancel the six and with the six here, we are left with four here. So this will be four into Q1 plus, uh, this will be two times 12. So two and two cancel out. Then I left with 12 here, Q, Q, Q2 equal to negative one. As I said that this will be one, I take it to the other side. Multiply also the entire numerator here, all the numerator by 120. So we also equate it to negative one, because this will be one, take it to the other side. Now for this one, you can see that uh, if I want to write 120, because it will be here in the numerator, in terms of 24, you can see that that will be five, because if I multiply this by five, I will get this one. So this will be five times 24, 24, 24, then I have five Q1 here, plus the other one will be 20, right? Because if I multiply uh, six by 20, right? Already two times six is 12, right? By 20. Q2 equal to negative one. So this is the system. Then I can write that in augmented matrix form quickly. Okay, uh, okay, I can even swap. I can take this to be my first equation and this to be the second equation. Why am I doing it? Just because five is greater than four. Anyways, just for convenience, you don't need to do that. But to make things simple for me, I will just take this one and 20 there. This is negative one. And then we have four and 12. 
and negative one. So this is our augmented matrix. Uh, this is R1, and the other one is R2. It's easy to do that anyway. Okay, so I need to zero this. So for me to zero this, what would be my multiplier here? So this one, I will replace with R2 minus the multiplier. First of all, I multiply this by one by five, and then I multiply by the numerator. So that would be four by five into R1. So you can see if I divide R1 by five, this become one, and then I multiply by four. So we have four, four, then we subtract, then we zero this one. So if we perform that next step, so I fix the first row. Now I perform this. I know already that this is zero. I replace that. Now, if I multiply this by negative four by five and substitute there, this becomes negative four and this will be negative one by five. So you can see, this is a factor of Q2. So you can see that if I divide them, we are applying now back substitution. If I you can cancel negative, negative become plus, then I divide this by four, this will be one by 20. So we can see already that from this one, our Q2 is one by 20, right? Now, if I come here, come here, this is five, Q1, I know already Q2, which is this one. I take that to the other side. I will say that is equal to negative one. Now this negative, this positive 20, when it will cross, it become negative 20. Then that's a factor of what Q2. So you can see that uh, that is one by 20. This cancels out like this. You can see that uh, we have negative one, negative one is negative two. You can see directly that Q1 is negative two by five, negative two by five. So we have this one, negative two by five for Q1. And we saw already that Q2 was one by, by 20, right? Is that what we found there? Negative two by five and then one by 20, negative, what is that? Oh. Negative two, uh, negative two by five, yes, that's what we have here. And one by 20, very good. So that is it. So that's how you quickly uh, solve uh, that. Now, once Q1 and Q2 are found, if you substitute uh, this here, right? If you substitute this, you have uh, P1 is one minus two by five. Then we have five minus two is three. You can see three by five directly. So you do the same thing for, for this is correct. So you do the same thing for P2, you get this, P2, you get that. Anyone can do it. And that is it. So once you have those values, substitute here. And you substitute there. You can even simplify further, right? Because generally in the in the test or the exam. I will, you will not be given something like that. You will always be given with that fraction. So meaning that here, if you don't want uh, that, you, you will multiply the numerator here by 60, and you also multiply here by 60, right? Because you know that 60, you can you can get rid of the all this denominator, and then you get terms without it. Okay, so uh, I hope that... Uh, the details or the detailed information on the procedure to perform a Pare approximation is clear enough. Right. And okay, here's just uh, this table, just give us a comparison between uh, Pare approximation and uh, the Maclaurin uh, series expansion. In our case, we can decide to use a fifth degree polynomial, P5, and compare with this R, R5 to see which one is more accurate. But don't forget that Maclaurin, if we truncate after, uh, I mean, if you use a fifth degree polynomial, it's an approximation. It's still an approximation, this one. And this is another approximation. 
Now, if we compare that with the exact expansion, this is the error term. We look at the various values of the error term. We will see that this one gives us a, a lower, uh, a lower, it, it gives us a lower expansion. So it gives us a, a, a lower, a lower result. It gives us a lower result. So it shows that uh, the approximation is very good. It gives us a very good approximation. All right. So we will stop here and we will continue very shortly with um, continual fraction. Thank you for this first part and see you very soon.